All right, the after lunch fun. All right, I can't do this. I'm a walker. I like to walk, as long as I don't fall off the stage, right? All right, well, first of all, thanks to the folks at Broadcom. Thanks to the folks uh, for inviting me to moderate this panel. Um, we're going to call this, uh, in the radio business, we call this a double shot Thursday. You know what a double shot Thursday is? That means you have me twice. So I get this panel, and then I get the one at the end of the day. So uh, it's not two for Tuesday. That doesn't work. It says Thursday. But all right. But uh, that being said, uh, as you heard, uh, I'm uh, Jason Miller from Federal News Network. Who heard of our name change? Raise your hand. Come on, give me, give me a little, a couple people. All right. Well, Federal News Network. So uh, usually at this time, I like to talk about AM radio because we're at 1500 AM on the AM dial. We have federalnewsradio.com, or actually now it's federalnewsnetwork.com. And usually I like to get audience participation going as well. So usually I will give you some uh, trivia. So instead of AM radio trivia, I have some network trivia. So you're gonna, this is all about audience participation to get you guys warmed up and going, because for our panel today, uh, after uh, our, our presenters present, we're going to go to audience questions, and I really want you guys to participate, because remember, I get paid as a journalist to ask questions, so this is really all about you, and they'd rather hear from you. So again, reminder, audience participation, let's go. Uh, what was the first TV network? Call it out. Yes. Snow. Keep going. NBC. NBC, someone's more. ABC, you're all wrong. No, it's called the Dumont Network. <laughs> Country's first permanent commercial television network, August 15, 1946, connecting New York City with Washington. Now, NBC launched in 1947, serving New York City, Philadelphia, Schenectady, a, hu a hub of TV, and Washington. And then later on, Baltimore and Boston were added in 1947. CBS and ABC went in 1948. So that's your one network. All right, here's a, this is an easy one for this crowd. Uh, next question. First computer internet work network came into existence roughly when? Easy one for the crowd. Hint, hint. 82. 82 earlier, much earlier. 50s. 50s uh, close. We'll call it the late 60s ARPANET, right? We've all heard of that. All right, last one. You guys are okay on audience participation. I know post lunch, I gotta wake you up a little bit. All right, this is from the movie network. Who saw the movie network, right? This is a famous line spoken by the character Howard Beale, played by Peter Finch who discovers he's being put out to pasture. Remember the line? Anyone? Close, right? I heard almost. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Now, you may be thinking, why am I bringing this up? Well, that won four Academy Awards, right? That's important. Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actor, uh, Actress, and Best Screenplay. But more importantly, in 2008, for the preservation in the United States Film Registry at the Library of Congress. So there's always a federal connection to all my uh, trivia. So uh, now you can Im in impress your family and friends later tonight at home and talk about network trivia. Um, so for the panel today, here's how we're going to work. I'm a big fan of pre-planned questions, so I've asked each panelist to take three to five minutes to something you don't know. They're going to bring some value to your discussion, and then after that, we're going to get into audience questions. I have the wireless to walk around, so uh, please participate. Um, let me offer a couple comments to start, though. Over the last 20 years, and, and that's how long I've been in the market, uh, I, I'm not sure there's been a technology that's caught on like automation has caught on. And let me give you some examples. There's huge interest in pilots around robotic process automation. IRS, GSA, HHS all have uh, different pilots going on. There's automation of cybersecurity. Uh, GSA's 18F is using automation to speed up the authority to operate or ATO process. They went from like six to nine months to like 30 days. USCIS has been using automation as part of its Agile or DevOps, DevSecOps is commonly called now, uh, to, to get capabilities into production more quickly. And then there's automation around citizen services. VA, for example, sees potential in using AI to get a handle on the hundreds of thousands of calls it receives daily from veterans seeking care. And even in acquisition, GSA recently added a automated contact center solution SIN, special item number 132-20 if you're keeping score at home. And that basically, uh, basically pre-vetted vendors with, with different contact solutions. And this is all very important right now because of, of several reasons. Number one, uh, the Trump administration estimates about 5% of all federal occupations could be automated entirely. 60% could have at least 30% of those activities automated. And basically, OMB believes 45% of the total work activities could be automated government-wide. So hence, there's a big push and a big acceptance of automation. So we know it's a hot topic, and I think the conversation is happening at a perfect time. So how can agencies use automation to simplify IT, create efficiencies, improve the ability to deliver services? 
Well, that's where our panelists come in, and I'm gonna turn to Frank Konecki from the Air Force to, to lead us off. Okay, uh, we have lots of things going, so I'll give you a su subset of what we're actually doing. Uh, the DevOps one is kind of interesting because we also have done DevOps already at the Air Operations Center. And in fact, in 30 days, we got it down to instantaneously. So based on the process that's coming out, the software's coming out, and we give it an ATO immediately because it's already been proven that the tool sets that are being used can actually certify that the security has been met already. Now, there's one little catch we also do. We also do a pen test of the software afterwards to validate that somebody didn't sneak something. However, the ATO basically, initial ATO starts right after you generate it. In fact, that's the way it looks for future S uh, Every time you do an update to the system, remember, usually never get an ATO, we give it immediately because it's through the same process. And so updating is very easy now, especially when we've done this for the ATOs or, or the air, t air tasking orders and things. We're also doing it across for other applications as well. We talked yesterday to ACC about actually enlarging it for their scope as well. That's one. Two, uh, mobility. Okay, I have to say mobile, because mobility means something else in the Air Force. <laughs> Mo mobile apps, uh, we're pushing mobile. We have one BYOD system out there right now, which is called Air Force Connect, which is basically allows the airmen to actually look at their own information. Now, it has a CAC reader for some of this because we haven't been able to get past the CAC reader piece for some of these applications. However, that was the first application that's out there. It's being effectively used uh, throughout multiple uh, bases right now. Uh, the purpose of this was a forerunner to actually push out a real BYOD application, which we are going to work on next week, getting the policies and everything else established to actually do this. Now, in doing that, we also have to have various authentication mechanisms and a mobile device management solution. And so we're looking at what multi-factors can we actually use on the phones now and the pads to determine what the authentication should be besides using a CAT card or, or uh, bringing down credentials. So we're looking at that as well. So that's something that we're really pursuing wildly. It's one of my taskers to finish before the end of the fiscal year. So it's, it'll be done. The uh, third thing is let's talk about data, data analysis whenever. I mean, what you, what you talked about is uh, ML and AI. Uh, we're actually using this to actually go forward with uh, looking at what parts are needed for engines. So we've done an uh, analysis of uh, the AIRWAC system right now that basically says here's, here's the trending that you get based upon weather and everything else as to when you should replace parts automatically. And so we're getting to the point where we can actually save money doing this, but we also are prepositioning parts now based upon this trending analysis to say, yes, this part's going to wear out, and therefore we should preposition this when the aircraft lands, we can replace the part. So we're doing that, and that's probably, that's three for me. That's good, three good ones. All right, I'm going to ask real quick the follow-up on the ATO. Um, so one of the things you brought up was this idea that when you want to get new capabilities, get an ATO can, you know, typically, traditionally can take way too long. So is it an ATO immediately because you're, what's being developed is based on a set of standards, you're in the set of guardrails, and if as long as it stays in the guardrails, then you know it's met the, the requirements there, and you just do the pen test there's, piece? There's several dynamic static analysis tests, scans done of the system, making sure that they're compliant, plus other things as part of the tool set that's actually being utilized. So it's just not, we just pump it out and we assume it's right. It's, there's lots of work behind it, in fact, there's actually a mapping of all the capabilities of what the tools actually do against an RMF. All right, so there's more there, but we're gonna turn to Courtney. Sure, uh, so we too at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services have a lot of different initiatives. Uh, our office is focused largely on the citizen services piece. So we uh, typically are trying to get the right information to the right person at the right time. And we have a lot of tools in place right now to do so. We spent several years building up our digital tools library, if you will. And I think now we're kind of moving into a phase where we figure out how better to leverage some of those or to integrate some of the tools within each other even. So for example, right now we have a secure inbox which allows people um, within a, an account to submit inquiries about case inquiries or just general inquiries. Uh, but those, that is uh, connected to our contact centers right now and requires an, a human touch to respond to those. They, may, they typically use template responses. Uh, so one of the things that we're looking to do is build, uh, or we, we are building, uh, a, a 
uh, a deep answer learning engine that will respond to using, uh, has learned our te templates and can respond to those inquiries automatically. And you can, it will uh, do so within seconds and you'll have your, res or less than seconds and have your response without having to then uh, submit that to a contact center to have a human intervention at all. Uh, we're hoping that what well, that will allow is for, for, for our uh, contact centers to handle the more difficult cases and really handle case resolution uh, for those individuals that need it and that, that larger, uh, you know, uh, percentage of cases that are inquiries that are, that are handled at the levels can, all of that can be automated. We don't see this in any way, shape, or form taking, uh, taking uh, anyone's job or anybody's responsibilities, but in fact it allows us to, to get to those, uh, those more ad advanced or technical cases more quickly. So we are, we are anticipating that uh, to happen in the next year or so, less than that, I would say. Um, and that, using that same technology, we are hoping that would be kind of our first iteration, but we would be looking for that same type of, of technology to then uh, serve as the back end for other things that we're doing. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our, our avatar, Emma, uh, and sh this is something that we anticipate we would use in that way as well, so that it would be uh, available outside of an account experience and, uh, and allow um, for much quicker responses, much more personalized responses, uh, and much more uh, advanced and technical responses to, to, the, to what she's able to provide right now. Another area that we've also spent some time in automation is around our processing times. So we have, uh, historically, it's been Excel spreadsheets that's, you know, one office reviews and then hands over to someone else and then it gets uploaded to, um, to present information on our website or wherever it may be. Uh, so we've automated a lot of that process. We've been able to pull in more historical information. We've been able to get more accurate information uh, and then develop um, and respond much more timely um, on our public website to, to the changes in our processing times. So we're a, rather than update you know, monthly or, or quarterly, we're able to update uh, daily, weekly, whenever we, we would like to. So that's something we're piloting with a small selection of forms. One of the issues as many people I'm sure are familiar with is change management. So although the public may be comfortable with us providing this information much more quickly, our internal stakeholders are not as comfortable with that process. Uh, so we're kind of having dual processes for the time being um, until people are, are more comfortable with that and then we can re and refine uh, the automation processes there. All right, so there's tons to follow up on. This is all great work. First one comes to mind is the last piece you said when you, when you talk about the change management side, and the fact is, we love to talk about automation, and, and when you, especially when you bring up something like robotics process automation, we had this conversation at lunch a little bit where it's not robots, it's an awful name, right, Josephine? You said uh, it's an awful name, huh? but it's the one we we're using, like IoT, awful name, but we're using it. But anyway, so so when you do the change management, when you're when you're looking at these um, estimates to 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 speed up the responses and the rates, mm -hmm. what's the back? What's what's the conversation you're having maybe with the folks who own the processor own the, the forms and how do you get them to see the, the light? Uh, well, so I think uh, the agency as a whole has really taken to concepts that like user-centered design and just co-creation more generally. So while uh, we, we involve whatever subject matter experts um, from the beginning, you, uh, policy, or counsel, every, everyone, uh, so that can sometimes be a, a slow process. Um, but I do think that has garnered a lot of support for what we've been able to accomplish and then uh, and a level of confidence and comfort in whatever we do. Excellent. All right. Let's move to, uh, now that was the front end, if you will, the, 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 the human touching side. Now we're going to talk maybe the back end and automation and how that makes the front end work, right? So David, maybe you start off. Yeah, so the, the nice thing uh, from, from the infrastructure uh, point of view, uh, you know, we, we continue to look at automation and, you know, it's been brought up a few times today. I like to look at automation as replacing tasks that, uh, you know, current employees are doing, not necessarily replacing their jobs because I think as we look at the modernization discussion this morning, we want to be focusing on the more advanced, intelligent application and development cycles versus coming in, running the same spreadsheet day after day, and it gets really mundane as a, as a task to those stakeholders. This simplify that through automation. Uh, you know, this make the back-end infrastructure be deployed in a timely fashion. Uh, to get the information that the application owners need 
uh, so they can quickly develop and improve their processes and they don't have to relate or you know, wait on the back end of getting a server deployed or getting a network port opened up. And, and then really from the customer point of view, from our side, we provide a lot of tools for our customers to take advantage of automation, but what we're really um, stressing is providing more of the use cases and that um, uh, kind of single button approach around automation. So uh, utilizing different use cases where if the application owners want to get reporting or visibility into the infrastructure, they now can get it through their orchestration framework versus having to go to the you know, independent IT silos that they have within the organization, each, each owner there has their own SLAs to get that information back to the application owner, which just takes too much time. So providing that back-end infrastructure, uh, uh, information through reporting functionality, uh, reduce the meantime or troubleshooting activities, pinpointing where the problem is, um, because, you know, IT infrastructures aren't getting uh, less complex, so we got to continue to uh, simplify some of the back-end complexity, uh, and that's one thing from uh, from our side. We're really striving with our customers is is helping uh, simplify uh, some of the deployments and really the visibility and the reporting through automation. All right. Now, one follow up occurs to me as you kind of went through it is what what you guys are trying to help with in terms of you and maybe a use case would be helpful i don't want to steal your next talk so i don't want to steal your thunder so you tell me if, if i'm going to do that but um like what's a use case that maybe you could delve into a little bit whether it's commercial or private sector or public sector is, is there one that you were able to so um yeah so i get the fortune uh, to talk right after this so that's i, why got, I, said all, I, I got all my use cases <laughs> after this but uh you know, one of the big thing, you know, and you brought up templates. So a lot of our customers still do a lot of management through Excel templates. And what we're, uh, what we're building for our use cases around automation, where they would fill out these templates and then they would turn it over to another organization or Excel spreadsheet. And then from an operational, they manually would go in and, and insert the information into our fabric or our, our networking components, which it takes a lot of time. Uh, and it really becomes an exercise in cut and paste of how quickly you can do it during the maintenance window. So what we're doing is building uh, the use cases or the solutions or really the application uh, to go read the template and automatically behind the scenes go create the, you know, the, the corresponding processes or tasks that normally would happen automatically. So instead of spending hours cutting and pasting from you know, 500 lines in a spreadsheet, it's done in a matter of 30 to 45 seconds. Uh, you can do the validation checks instantly, where you don't have to now go back and manually go through um, some type of Uh, I'm in the integrated offerings group of Dell EMC, uh, so one thing that you probably don't know what integrated offerings means is we have a, uh, a handful of products that basically support our storage arrays and our storage solutions. Um, of course, one of my favorite ones is Connectrix, which is actually Connectrix B-Series, which is Brocade. We're partnered with Brocade. So how do people connect to their storage? Through our... OEM brocade switches. So brocade has been a great partner to us. We're their largest uh, OEM partner, and um, we we uh, definitely are on board with this uh, with the automation that brocade is uh, proposing on many of these tasks. Because we do we do get from our customers often that they are spending a lot of time on these mundane, repetitive tasks and. And, and, and there's the human error factor, so what David was talking about is, is, is spot on. And then, um, so some of our other products that we have, that we have uh, one cloud app that's actually, customers love this, this app, it's called Cloud IQ, and what it does basically is it, 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 it's basically a, a health tracker for your storage environment. And it, 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 it comes on all of our storage arrays, and it's, it, it's a no cost item. And it actually has a phone app that you can monitor the healthiest storage. It gives it like health scores. It does analytics behind the scenes. It, it autom it, there's, there's a lot of back end in this product. And then um, we, we also have um, 
products that enable the database administrators to, to more of a self-service model. So if anyone's ever dealt, been a, a storage admin and dealt with um, database uh, administrators, they, they always need more space. They always want to test stuff. They need like a bucket for this, for that. And you know, in the old storage spinning disk arrays, you, you always had this, this overhead and you know, you, you were limited in what you could give them. But now with the newer technologies, with the flash arrays, there's, um, everything lives in metadata now and it doesn't take up any space and you can have hundreds of copies. So we have a, a tool that can actually enable the, the database to be uh, kind of self-serving, put it on a scheduler, run it every time they want a copy of a database. It's called AppSync and, and these are part of the products and the solutions that we have. We also have some other ones called SRM that is, uh, it's more of a you know, server based but it's still a tool where it, it did have some auto, automation features built in. They were um, add on features, but um, what, is, what it does though, it, it takes a lot of time you know, for diagnosis, troubleshooting, whereas some of these solutions actually enable the, the storage admins to manage the environment you know, in a more efficient manner. Uh, they could tell what's, what's important to, to jump on a call at midnight with. A lot of times they could look at it and be like, all right, I can handle that at 10.30 in the morning. This is not a big deal. Nothing's gonna fall apart with this one. So I, I mean, overall, I think Dell EMC has done a really great job with, since Dell and EMC merged. Um, we now have an end-to-end -end solution, so it's actually really helped our customers because we, we actually had, you know, many of our customers were like Dell users with EMC storage anyway, like Dell servers, so it actually plays in perfectly with the Brocade being our partner and it just really works out well for customers. And all of these products that we have have, um, you know, availability of REST APIs that with, with uh, scripting in the application layers, you can actually, you know, make a, 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 a true automated environment across your, your, uh, your storage network. All right, so um, I'm gonna throw maybe a little bit of a curveball at you. All right. right. Um, and then we're gonna get to audience questions, so think of your questions. Um, you talked a lot about storage and, and how storage and storage arrays support the automation but you didn't tell me how it does. So maybe if you, since you, you know, I saw you're an engineer, so don't, don't, don't get too in the weeds for me, all right, because I'm not that smart. <laughs> but help me out, understand, why is storage important to automation? What, what does storage bring? Well, I, customers with, with, with the storage environments, they have to monitor like what they got for capacity, what, what they got left for capacity, when they have to add more, when they have to refresh, when. So, you know, with, with pulling in all this data that, that's being collected, with the, with the automated dial home, we have automated dial home built into these. They have a, a product called ESRS, and basically it's available to everyone who has our storage. And it, 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 it collects the data from the storage array. It, it, you know, it has like, it knows when the end of life of the product is, it knows when the, uh, you know, it, it knows when components are breaking, it knows. It, so it gives you almost that automated yeah, and it gives you like what's a happening, score. when, the health, and then right. you can make decisions. And, and, and the, the, the cloud app that we have that goes along with that, you can actually customize it where you can put it into groups of like, say, this application. So as, you know, I, I know in certain areas, there's, there's pockets of people don't want to like consolidate things. They want to have, you know, I got my storage here, I got this here, they want to keep things separate. Well, w you can actually do it with a lot of virtualization now, whereas you can share all the same physical equipment, but you just partition it, you know, and virtualize, and then just, you know, this is my piece, and I want to get the score on this, this particular app, and it'll tell you the health of that one, and you could, you could, it takes a little setup in the back, but once you get it going, huh? it's a set it and forget it, and then set just it. keep. Set it and forget it. <laughs> all right, who's got a question in the audience? No questions. Come on. Oh, there we go. I was like, whoa. Give me a second. All right. Saw his hand first, so tell me who you are. Hi. Thank you guys very much for being on this panel. My name is Kyle Clarep. I am a Presidential Management Fellow, uh, data scientist with the IRS, currently on external detail to NASA. Whew, that was a lot. Um, <laughs> so we've heard about a lot of cool applications for automation. Um, from the engines for, for jets to uh, uh, getting templates for information to be, to be filled in more, more efficiently and faster. My question is, why did those, uh, why were those projects chosen? How did that meet the whatever criteria to be the things to be automated? Let me go first. I can go first. Yeah. Uh, 
it, it was chosen for two things. The data was available, which is what you have to have enough data to actually do this, because otherwise it, it's useless. And it was uh, a cost-saving measure. I mean, that was the two things that, that said this would be really good to do. And that, that was the real reasons why they did, we did the engine analysis, just, just that. And we're going to continue that out. But again, it's a question of do you have the right data and do you have enough of it? Yeah. And I was going to say something similar, one, about the data and also just about business value. So whether it's cost, cost reduction or for us, we are seeing an increase in, in certain requirements for our, on the adjudication side of our work. Um, so we have to, we've been trying to figure out ways in which we can uh, allow uh, our adjudicators time to focus on their casework as opposed to some of the other things. So um, that's, that's what largely drives a lot of our decisions. Mm -hmm. And from the infrastructure side, we looked at where, what are our administrators spending the most time on? And then the second aspect, out of those tasks, which ones are more error prone just by fatigue of doing the same process over and over? And that's where we really focus on our development and, and really making this turnkey for our customers uh, to really eliminate the human factor and make the infrastructure just more reliable and available for our customers. And those were the primary, when we looked at R&D and development and where do we want to write the toolkits or the utilities, it was on those areas. And again, this gives them more value to focus on other aspects of the business. All right, very good, another question. Thank you all for uh, particip participating in the panel today. I'm uh, Alan Hill from the Department of Education. I'm the director for IT services. And our favorite thing is these little things we carry around to log into the network. Mm -hmm. And Frank, you mentioned about mobile. Mm -hmm. Where do you see derived credentials going in the future to where we're not leveraging these things walking around anymore? Okay, we, we can do derived credentials right now as long as it's a managed device. Mm -hmm. Now, a managed device for, for BYOD means I have to have an MDM that puts a container down or controls that container. So we can do derived credentials for all that right now. The question is, and it's a security question. Do you, Wednesday I give you drive, this is my favorite question, in fact, <laughs> here's a lot. Uh, as soon as you log into your device with your pin or whatever, you have your credentials. And the problem becomes, if I hit you on the head, I also have your credentials now. And so there has to be another form factor that involves for the authentication further to give you sure you have access. And that's why we started going through what biometrics and everything else can we have on that device to actually look at what, what you know, another response, challenge response action that we want to do. Besides, you know, you can send messages back to the phone, you can do, so we're looking at all those factors as to what we really need to secure it more than just to drive credentials. But yeah, we can do drive credentials pretty much, but it's, it's, not, it's enough to start, but it's not enough to actually finish. All right, does anyone want to jump on the, the mobile piece right now or no? All right, let's do another question. Hi, there's a question to Frank. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the panel members, I used to be uh, with two different agencies under DOD. And as an employee, and also I think as a customer, it's very frustrating when you have multiple systems. It's over 20 some odd systems that uh, is under DOD. So if you're trying to interface a transaction, not only in terms of the cost efficiency, but in terms of timeliness, payment to, to a vendor, you have all kinds of slowdowns. So what is the solution? Why, why is the DOD can't have, say, one or two uh, interfaceable systems throughout the whole military system? If you can answer that, please. Thank you. Why? <laughs> can you fix it? Can you fix, can fix all it? the problems? No. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to fix it. <laughs> I mean, the, the bureaucracy, I mean, depends on the system. Depends on the system owner. And you got to remember that as, as, we, as everybody feels systems out there, they have a certain lifespan and a certain PEO that's associated with that and a certain funding line. So if we, in fact, we're trying, I'll tell you what we're trying to do. For instance, for the logistics side, we're trying to interface three legacy systems into a mobile device. Now it's three systems into a mobile device where it's two-way communication with that mobile device against three legacy systems. It's not easy, <laughs> but we're trying to do that for other factors as well because you just can't, I mean, we would love to say, okay, let's convert all our systems to something that's, you know, has great user interface and, and it's connected to each other. And it, it's just not feasible with the amount of money and everything that we have to put. So we're trying to figure out a different way of actually presenting to the user an integrated viewpoint as opposed to actually fixing everything in the high. Because you, you will fix some of the stuff because we are migrating a lot of the applications. But the migration cycle, which you, you know, everybody says, does migrate tomorrow? <laughs> it's not that way because it depends upon you know, your budgetary problems that you have, your vendor that you have, who you want to procure the next one from, because we don't really build a whole lot of applications ourselves as the Air Force. But 
Can you stop? Just yeah. step back for a second, and not to oversimplify it, because obviously I'm not a programmer, but if you look in terms of, of, of the cost of maintaining oh, yeah. systems, you know, and I'll just give you a small example. When I was at USIS, which is, of course, Uniform Services, mm -hmm. University of Health Sciences, they bought into the Oracle system. I think it's been about six years ago. Now, here it is, the commercialized system. They try to manipulate that to be federally compliant. And all the patch jobs and cost of runs of putting a new process in, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And I think of the, the poor students that are trying to follow, for example, a travel order out of DTS, or you have other procurement issues, and, and you have all these agencies that are trying to work with each other. It's just, it's just very cost and effective. And I can't imagine it's that difficult to, to, to break down or to close down old it's systems, old legacy systems, and, 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 and build fewer systems. It's just a question of who's opinion. controlling the systems and who has the plan to put them together. The, this, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a function of bureaucracy, especially when you cross different, different functional boundaries, for instance. I can't tell A1 to do something because, a, because logistics wants it. Right. And, and this is, I would say, this is completely our, our experience as well. Yes. So it's not one department or the other or anything like that, but there really are those types of, whether it's contracting challenges, you know, uh, service owner, business owner, IT owners, whatever it might be, there's all kinds of um, challenges there, you know, where, where things are in migration or not, you know, understanding all of these pieces and nothing ever just lines up. You know, it yeah. just doesn't. Just so, not. so, um, and the more people and more or more services or systems that you involve, the more integrations, the more challenges and, and errors that are likely to happen as well. So it doesn't all just just kind of fall into place as nicely as any of us. Would I mean, like. I, I can say if we we had you know billions of dollars to do migration, we would use it. <laughs> and you get the systems you like, but we don't have billions of dollars to do that, and that's it's a function of reality of the budget, you know, and it's just you know. It's very difficult to migrate like a big legacy system, really, because it just takes forever. And part of the reason why there's a push for automation is to help get off those old legacy yes. systems. I mean, if you, Dave, maybe jump in, because one of the things that you're talking about is that back-end data piece. And if you could figure a way to automate, automatically pull the data, if you could automatically fill in those Excel spreadsheets, that then potentially you, you could shut down that front end system. I'm making this up maybe, so <laughs> not if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, the, the less steps you have in some of these processes, especially when you look at the storage side um, and, and really help simplify, you're, you know, you're gonna provide more value to the people that actually have to utilize it on the front end. So, uh, you know, we'll continue to strive to, uh, to make the back end as simple as possible. Okay, another question in the audience? All right, so it's still, po oh, there you go. I was like, it's still post lunch. Uh, 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 just a question for the, the Air Force guy. I don't, I don't you know, <laughs> Frank, okay, sorry about that. It's okay. Okay. Um, in order to automate the complicated process they have to do with the Air Force, um, they really do have to simplify the procedures of how to get work done. When I was working as a civilian for them, uh, I was hired and pressured my boss to move the change orders up at the higher headquarters, move them faster, try to badger them to move it faster. And the people at the higher headquarters were seeming not paid to slow the stuff down. So you had one <laughs> office paid to slow the process down in our office where, where the taxpayer is paying somebody to speed it up, the same process up. And, uh, and I'm trying to, trying to figure out uh, those who empower the Air Force aware of that and seeing how they can simplify that, and the, and the more they're able to simplify procedures and processes, the easier it is to go with automation, you know? And, and not only that, but the uh, complicated data entries we had to do in, our, in the facilities engineering, uh, you know, and, and somehow, I don't know, in some way trying to figure out how to, how to, how to automate and simplify that. It's going single data entry and all that, thanks. So all right. The, uh, I mean, we, we're trying to, in fact, right now we're cutting out a lot of the Air Force regulations and instructions, basically cutting them back down because a lot of it was just that. It was do this, do this, do this, and it got too complex. And people were looking at how much work they had to do. Which we're trying at the same time to effect, of, effect lots of change based on mission. For instance, the, uh, you talk about you know, civil engineering or whatever. We have a process right now that we're trying to put LTE on, a, on every base. LTE networking capability. Now, 
the normal process takes two years to actually get a, a lease out. We are now cutting that down to three and a half to four months because we actually worked with them and said, we want this done now. And it takes, it takes lots of work to actually work with these people to get it done, but we've had the first base, we were bundling bases together, so we had the first bundle released uh, a couple weeks ago, and we we're going to have the award probably in January. That's probably faster than ever has been done before. <laughs> but it's a question of need and requirements to actually do this. And as I said, we want to do mobile, but we can't do mobile unless we have LTE at the bases. So this is the, the push that we have. This is the thrust, and you have to understand, it supports mission. And that's what all this is about, supporting mission. All right, another question. Uh, this question's for Frank. <laughs> and, uh, sorry. You've got such a big organization, you're, you're a very interesting <laughs> dude. But uh, I guess my question is, is, is how do you bring these technologies to the, the leadership teams? And you know, how do you present, is, is this something that you, you say, here, this is a solution that we can provide for you? Or is it something that the management teams come to you and say, okay, Frank, this is a problem we have, how can you fix it? How, how does that? How does that work? And then also, it sounds like if you're doing automation, I'm sorry for the multiple questions, but, but how do you get leadership to change their business processes on top of that? Because obviously, if you're automating processes that are manual, there's going to be new business processes that take its place. Okay. The, uh, we, we go back and forth. I'm in charge of developing the uh, target baseline, looking for future state for two to, three, two to three to five years out. So I look at problem spaces. We get problem spaces from the the, uh, the functionals, if you will, every six months, three, three, four months, that says, here's a problem space we actually have. Can you guys figure out a technology that will support that problem space? So we play both ways. I, invent, I talk to lots of vendors uh, like every, every week, three to five a week is, is the average. And I find something that's interesting. And we bring in people from the various functional domains that say, this may be interesting to you because we don't know everything that they're doing out there. And so we, we play a, an exchange of information try to support these guys. We, we, we do lots of, I, I work with all the CTOs and the other, and, and all the managed comps and the functionals, and we have meetings like every other week, to talk about innovation and, and what we want to produce in the Air Force. So we, we play that game. Now, bringing it to senior management is interesting because it's, it's a question of mission and money. So if you make a justification that the mission is necessary, you'll probably get the money. And so it's a question, the functional users have to come back and say, hey, I really need this because I need to, to have more efficiency or effectiveness in my mission, then naturally it flows out and the technology will flow accordingly and you'll do a pilot, you'll do an uh, other transaction authority to figure it out, you can do a test. And so we're playing multiple OTAs, multiple tests at the same time with different functional communities to say, hey, try this out, see if this meets your requirement. Lou, let me throw a question at you as well because as we're sure. talking through this a little bit and, and I think um, he brings up a good point about the functionality when you were talking about the, the services and the solutions, w one of the things you've talked about was this idea of, of you can look at and see what's happening, what, what, what's potentially going to break, what's going to potentially be out of date, what needs to be updated and when. When you present that to a customer, what's the reaction from the customer in the sense of, is that, is that a driving factor toward maybe automation? Is it a driving factor toward IT modernization? The two obviously can come, to cross, come together. Well, I think um, when we present, when we demo that, you know, that this comes with this storage array that you're buying, it, it becomes like a differentiator in many cases because when they look at it and they say like, wow, I can monitor this from my phone, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> we don't have any, we, really, we, we don't have any other like, um, we don't have any, that we're probably the only ones doing that right now with this. Right, right, but uh, I guess, I'll, let me put a finer point on it. Because I'm interested from the agency perspective, the customer perspective, okay. how does that drive the automation side, how does this drive them to to change? Because as, as the question was, when you know, how do you get people to change, right? Well, I think and when they when they see what the product is doing for them on just from the storage level, saying, "Hey, wow, this is really great. Wouldn't it be great if we could do this for our whatever?" They got like an app and they want to monitor it internally, like specific to the app. They could actually at that point say, "All right, what do we got to do to build something like this? How?" And then that's where. That's where you get the guy that knows how to script to bring him in. And that's when Courtney's group comes in. That's where these guys' well, team comes I, in. I was just going to add, you know, I think as, as we um, build more services yeah. and things like that and are leveraging the cloud more and there's all kinds of different 
for us, it's uh, channels with the public, all of that. We're trying to cap, we have so much data and, and from different sources that we're looking for ways to pull it all together. Right. Um, and, and having that, um, having those tools available to us is really helpful. Um, you know, I think the, the proof is in the pudding when, you know, also once you, once you implement, making sure all those integrations actually work and, yeah. that, and that, that data it, it is real time or it's actually giving you what you need to actually do whatever the analysis um, or, or whatever it is that you might be using the information for on, on the back end. That's, that, to me, is, is, becomes the selling point for other, other things that you do in the future. We have time for one or two more questions. Anyone in the audience? Because I'll ask. All right. All right. So, so let's maybe talk about because one of the things that, that came up when we talk automation is is the moving from low value to high value work, right? The the push from the administration. So maybe Dave, you start with on the back end infrastructure when you talk to systems administrators, what type of work will they maybe eventually stop doing? What what where is automation going to replace that low value work in your eyes? Yeah, I think on the infrastructure, it's it's. Uh, I, you know, at least from the storage and the networking and the compute layers with virtualization, it, it's becoming more proactive. Um, and a lot of this is through the tools, through the back end uh, reporting of the data or the information to put it in the hands of the people, um, the application owners, mm -hmm. um, versus always viewing IT as reactive if there is an issue. And then trying to get the right teams involved to go, you know, uh, look at where the troubleshooting activity or where to start. And, and that just takes too much time today. So the more that we can automate and, and get the right set of data for the right customers, uh, depending on their role, uh, we'll become a lot more proactive uh, and indirectly more efficient, and, but more strategic on uh, being able to do more with future technologies versus always supporting uh, what's deemed as the legacy application, the legacy devices in the environment, moving that into more of a strategic front. And I think the key point that Dave was making was this idea of proactivity, right? We hear this all the time. We've got to be more proactive. We've got we to gotta get ahead of the threat, right, Frank? I mean, you've got to be ahead of the, the game instead of behind it. So let me just throw this because we have about 30 seconds left or so, and, and I'll look around for one last question. Okay. Um, Frank and Courtney, jump in just real briefly each. Um, the, being more proactive, how does this move to automation make, lets you be more proactive uh, from where you sit in, in, in the, the different missions you help support? Well, so maybe obviously, Frank. we want to be predictive of what's going on. So with cyber threat analysis and everything else, we want to be able to predict everything that occurs, as well as we want to be able to track everybody everywhere as to you know what the threat is. I mean, if you talk about you know look, looking at the air battle space, the question is, what data can we get to actually know everything that's going to happen in their battle space ahead of time so we don't walk into something that's a disaster. And like the plane parts, you have a plane part that has yes. 30,000 miles and you're at 27,000. Right, you better get ready to have that part replaced yeah. somewhere and it better be right when you need it as opposed to, you know, grounding that, that aircraft for days until you get the part FedEx to you. All right. And Courtney, real quick. Uh, I would just say it helps with, um, like our workforce management, so moving work around becomes much more e uh, much easier uh, when we have some of these resources available. All right, short and sweet, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I see we're out of time, so let's uh, thank the panel for their, thank you guys for your participation. And now, uh, Dave, I turn you over, to, I turn the podium to you. Awesome. <laughs>